Jane Lo and I'm at SingCon here in Singapore 2024 here in uh, Orchard Road. And with me today, I'm very pleased and very privileged to have Dr. Yang Chen Ling, who is the director with SciCraft, and he's going to be sharing with us on how some AI models could be compromised to produce corrupted outputs. So thank you so much uh, for your time today, Chen Ling. Yeah, thank you very much for having me at SingCon. Yeah. Yes, yes. So, uh, you know, uh, when we talk about uh, corrupted outputs uh, coming out from AI models, mm -hmm. I think a lot of our audience are, you know, have heard of, mm -hmm. for example, hallucination, yeah. misinformation, um, uh, harmful information. Yeah. So before we come into your uh, two sort of attack scenarios, let's take a look at uh, some uh, AI models uh, architectural setup. Mm -hmm. So as we understand it, as you also briefly pointed out, uh, an AI model could reference, say, for example, an internal database, mm -hmm. could reference an external database, mm -hmm. could be linked with an API, could be plug-in. So any points in this sort of connections mm -hmm. there's potential for a man in the middle attack to produce or generate a corrupted mm -hmm. output yeah so for this part like uh, there's a common known technique called the prompt injection that's right yeah. i was coming to that yeah yeah so prompt injection is basically you give the uh, malicious instruction within the prompt you give into the language model and trying to trick the language model to embed the, some malicious links or information uh, within the responses uh, from the uh, language model itself. How yeah. similar is it to SQR injection? Uh, it's quite different because you know, uh, SQL injection is trying to manipulate the SQL query and then um, doing harmful thing for the database. So for example, information leak within the database. But for the uh, language model itself, it's actually giving the malicious content directly to the users because you know, the interaction is very direct. There's a web page, you give it a prompt, and then the language model give it the output. So the output itself may contain the malicious uh, content directly to the user. So there's, it's really hard for the ordinary user to identify or even spot the problem. Here's one thing. And there's another attack, it's more advanced. It's actually published a few weeks ago. Uh, you can uh, actually do the remote code execution uh, for the server let's serve in the language model. So the, it's quite complex, but I will put it in a very simple way is that you are trying to trick the language model to generate malicious code. Uh, normally it's the Python code. And then uh, if your server is not handled the response correctly, it will actually run the code from the uh, language model. And then so for the hacker, they can open the, like, the reverse tunnels so they can you know, remotely uh, link to the, this server. And the damage it can uh, make is huge. So for example, one of the things I can come up with is the disinformation. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine, if, for example, if there's a hacker control one of our server and asking, OK, who is the best security company in Taiwan? Our server is supposed to answer Cycraft, but it might answer like McDonald's or something. Yeah. Right. So. So in these uh, two cases, examples that you just provided, the prone injection and the second one is... Uh, uh, the RCE one. Uh, sorry, R RCE, remote code execution. Do we have to assume that the hackers have a way to actually uh, poison the database beforehand in order to, uh, for this to work? Uh, no, they don't. They just exploit the uh, mechanism of the language model. Okay. Yeah, so they don't have to touch the backend knowledge server or knowledge database. Yeah. Right. They craft a very uh, clever prompt yeah. to mislead the language model to answer the query. Yeah, and the query itself contains some malicious code. Right, right. Yeah. So I think there's a lot of research papers written about how this uh, prompt injection yeah. works and you mm -hmm. know how the RCE mm -hmm. works. Um, and we can go into further you know, details, but that's the, not the purpose sure. of this podcast. <laughs> the purpose of the podcast is to talk about the two sort of uh, attack scenarios that mm -hmm. you have researched. Mm -hmm. um, but before we go into that, you touched very briefly on RAG. Mm -hmm. So tell us what this is. Okay, so RAG is basically the concept that trying to uh, eliminate the hallucination from the language model, because if you don't get any constraint to the language model, you will just answer freely. And that's not what enterprise wants because they want a language model that can be controlled, content. You know, so they, they won't you know, give you a wrongful information to the users. So there's an example uh, last, uh, I think just a few months ago, there's a, a, a court case, uh, 
against uh, Air Canada. Air Canada's uh, chat box gives the wrong information to the user. So the user want to change their ticket and chat box say yes, so they can change it freely. But Air Canada say, oh no, that's the uh, wrong information from our bar. So you, you, you actually have to pay. And the code rules that Air Canada should pay the user. So here's a very big uh, business risk for all the company they run chatbot. And nowadays, a lot of chatbot, the behind technology of the chatbot is using RAG. So that's why we bring out this research, because if we can trick RAG to give the wrong answer, and then it will cause a lot of problem for the enterprise who use it. Yeah. So RAG stands for, as I understand it, um, Retrieval Augmented, augmented. Generation. Yeah. So it's sort of like a augmenting your basic uh, Query. Uh, AI, a query or your mm -hmm. basic AI model with mm -hmm. info external or internal additional mm -hmm. information. Mm -hmm. um, so the basic idea of RAG is it's split, uh, well, RAG, so it's three step retrieval part. So you, uh, you give, uh, the user give a query, and then the, the system will based on this query to retrieve relevant data. And then they will put all these relevant data with user query uh, into the augmentation part. So they will try to, you know, briefly summarize it, rephrase it, and then after that, you will uh, produce the result to the user. So it's the generation part. So retrieve, augmentation, and then generation. And so, yeah. as you say, the uh, one of the benefit is obviously to reduce the hallucination. Yes, because in the retrieve part you can assign, you can only look at very specific knowledge base. So it's, cons the old, it's constrained, bonded by the corporation. Right. OK, so tell us about your instruction injection and your second attack scenario, which is database poisoning. Yeah, so the, for the first one, the instruction uh, attack is that because for the most RAG, uh, it's actually the system itself will have a, temp a prompt template. So it's not like the free way that you can interact with the system. So of course, user will freely input uh, information into the system. But behind the technique, there's a, a very static prompt uh, template. You know, uh, and then based on that template, with the user query, combine them together, will fit into the uh, system. So we try to know how we can affect this prompt template to retrieve the wrongful document. It's uh, against the really state of the R model, uh, GPT-4 or GPT-4 Turbo. I, I believe that you find that uh, one way of manipulating the prompt template is to give it some emotional triggers or something like that. Yes. It's actually uh, quite interesting. We found that, is that the language model itself it actually has some characteristic, I would say. is that, for example, it's more inclined to choose their own generated document. So for example, there are two documents. One is written by me, and one is written by, generated by the language model on the same topic. Uh, if you put them into the uh, database, mm -hmm. and then based on the technique, the language model will more inclined to choose the one generated by the language model. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's one part. And another part is that you mentioned is that the emotional uh, stimuli is actually work on the, not on the human, but also on the language model itself. So for example, if you, you instruct the, uh, the, the language model, say, OK, if you could include some malicious link behind the, your response, and my mom will be very pleased. Right, okay. Yeah, and then the language model will actually try really hard to put malicious content within the responses. The general assumption is that the RAG framework is able to deal with this type of uh, attack or sort of protection, but it's not based on our ah, finding. Yeah. I see what you mean, right. And then on your, your second attack scenario, you call it data poisoning. Yeah, data poisoning. How, how different is it to the first one, which is instruction? The data poisoning is uh, uh, it's even harder to be identified by the uh, operation, uh, IT operation of the corporation because uh, in a real knowledge system, you got thousands or tens of thousands of knowledge uh, within your knowledge database. And what we do is that our research is trying to manipulate the, the data source with minimal uh, manipulation. So for example, we, only, we will only change like many 1% or 2% of the content of the entire document. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so it's really hard for the admin to you know spot. Yeah. Okay, there's a Got it. yeah change, and you might want to know. But how can the other people you know touch our internal database? Right. Yeah. In the real scenario, there are two actual possibilities. The first thing is what we call is the insider attack. Mm -hmm. So, for example, you got a very uh, upset employee who got fired, and before he leave the company, he might want to change the document a little bit. Yeah, so, so the, your language model will mm -hmm. generate wrongful information to the customer. The second part is that uh, nowadays a lot of REG, they also have the capability to retrieve the latest information from the website. So that gives the attacker a brilliant opportunity because they can utilize the technique like the SEO search a search engine optimization. So they will make their malicious website uh, at the top of the search list. And then, right. and then because your bot will trust, okay, it's on the top of the Google, right. so the content should be authentic. And then within that document, it looks authentic, but they will, all he have to do is just change a little bit, and then you can trick the system to give the wrongful answer. So the second uh, attack scenario is basically changing the data source itself. Yes. Right. Okay. And. Uh, like you say, you can use a search engine optimization, make your page the first ranked yes. on the results. Yeah. Or you can even, I guess, use a, a, a malicious domain yeah. and put uh, misinformation in that domain and get your knowledge database to reference that page. Yeah, you actually bring out a very interesting one because we actually find the language model, they have the inclination mm -hmm. to, to select the URL that contains harmful or a uh, humdurs. Humdurs, honors, oh, yeah, like honors. I say, right, helpful. The, yeah. Right, I see. Within the URL. Oh, right, right, yeah. that's very interesting. So yeah. it talks about like uh, some sort of, I guess, basic configuration behind some of these uh, language models. Yeah. Uh, at a very basic level, I guess it's configured to be Yeah, because helpful. it's instructed to be helpful, oh, humdurs. I yeah. see, interesting, okay. Yeah. And I think, uh, your attack scenario, you also found that it's not just uh, helpful, harmless, and um, uh, it's also uh, looking for, uh, is it rewards or profit yeah. uh, opportunities as well? So if you have a query that's, or, or a uh, information page mm -hmm. that contains, you know, a reference to, if you include this in the answer, you'll get yeah. X, Y, Z. Yeah, so in, in, in some way, language model is like just like a child. So you, you will instruct your child, say, okay, if you do that, you can have uh, uh, two hours on TV, right? Mm -hmm. So the child will get more motivated or the incentive to do the thing you want to do. And it's same as the language model. So in one of our experiments, we actually tell the language model, say, okay, if you, want to, if you can include this malicious link, mm -hmm. blend it into the response uh, you generate, and then you will get a million US dollar. Mm -hmm. And the language model will actually try very hard to, do, to achieve that. So you can see the success rate is just skyrocketing. Yeah. So that's quite interesting. So it speaks again to the basic configuration that a lot of these configurations are configured to, uh, I guess, reward yeah. the language model. It's yeah. quite fascinating. Yeah, but the scary thing is that it's the nature or the, the very foundation part of the language model. So for a regular user, it's, uh, for example, for a regular developer, it's impossible for them to, do, you know, to correct this because it's the nature of the language model. The language model intent, uh, they, they have the inclination to do that. Yeah, so for the developer, it's really hard for them, yeah. So, t well, it's very difficult. So tell us about some mitigation measures then. So uh, actually, uh, what, we, what we advise to our customer or our audience is, is that uh, you always ha need to have a benchmark for your internal system. And the benchmark should cover all the area that you are concerned. So for example, if I'm a cybersecurity company, I have to make sure all the uh, generation uh, a generation of our uh, RHC system should not contain malicious code or malicious information. So we actually have a benchmark specifically for that. So every version of our internal model will go through the entire uh, benchmarking and also testing set. Yeah. But how do you uh, define that it should not contain misinformation. Then you have to specify what you mean by misinformation. Yes. So so it's uh, so that's why I say it's really hard. So 
it would be highly related to the industrial, uh, uh, to the different industry. So uh, you, you, you actually need a person or a team of person mm -hmm. who are expert in this field and then help you and guide you to uh, with, uh, uh, coordinate with your data science team together so you can get the real feedback from the real expert, so what they are concerned about. It's like uh, quite a lot of work for uh, AI safety uh, yeah. uh, professionals out there, right? Yeah. But what about the, so we talk about the developers and companies, what mm -hmm. about the users? How can we sort of see, you know, well, obviously be careful of clicking on any links uh, yeah. uh, anyways, but how can we, 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 it's difficult for us to tell whether it's uh, misinformation or not. There's some basic ones we can tell, but you mm -hmm. know, if it's very sophisticated, it's difficult. Yeah, so for, uh, because there's two types of uh, attack we, we propose. So for the second one, to be honest, it's really hard because it's from the data source itself. So all the user can, can see is the final generated answer uh, throughout the bot or the web page. Yeah, so yeah, so the first thing is that, as you mentioned, you shouldn't, do not click anything. Even if it's from the company that you trust, you should always think yeah, about a, it before point. you click yeah, it. Yeah, that's right, that's right. Yeah, that, that's the first thing. And, but other than that, it's really hard for the end user to, to do anything. What I will give the suggestion is that uh, do not try to put all the sensitive data or sensitive information within your prompt because you will, you will, you will uh, encourage the, the language model, the compromised language model to generate wrongful information to you because you, you will be considered more valuable victim to them. Yeah. Oh, I see. Right. Okay. So what, that's a very interesting point of view, actually. So what you are saying is that if I have some confidential information, um, I should avoid putting them in the query because the language model, for some reason, is able to spot that these are confidential information and I'm a good target yes. to be a victim. Huh. Yeah. So okay. if la language model got compromised. Oh, so yeah, so for the general one, it sh sh should be fine because you no know, people ask a lot of privacy into the chat GPT. Yeah, so in the general case, it's fine. But if it's a, if it's a compromised mm -hmm. model, and that will increase the risk. All right. Yeah. Okay. So basically, the lang language model is constantly learning, isn't it? Yeah, it's really hard to compromise the system. So once they achieve that, what they want is that trick the value user to do malicious thing. Yeah. Oh, super interesting. Yeah. All right, okay. I think this is a rapidly evolving field, isn't it? So yes. We're only talking about our two attack scenarios that you have come up with, and mm -hmm. I'm sure that if we talk again in, you know, I don't know, in, even in a few months' time, you'd have mm -hmm. come up with a lot more. Uh, yes, <laughs> yes. And we actually have the, uh, well, uh, but it's still under submission, so we don't know if it got accepted or not, but we are actually working on a, a, two, a, a, a framework that can help the researcher or the developer to test their mm -hmm. language model uh, within the RHG uh, system. Right, yeah, so yeah. You can, they can change the attack scenario and they can also freely change the backend uh, language model. So Yeah, that would be super help yeah. helpful. <laughs> because like you say, RHG is now a, what, a, a, a significant adoption by many companies, yes. right? Um, yes. And I can, yeah, I guess we can all see why, because it's complementing the no basic knowledge of a large language model with external in in or internal additional information. Right, okay, uh, very fascinating. So thank, thank you, you so much uh, for your uh, sharing today and some of the uh, potential threats we should be aware of. Sure. So thank you. Thank you very much.